We're going to begin a kind of a new series on Sunday evening. We are uh, going to be having a kind of, well, we're going to call it a spring revival. Um, certainly, I don't think you can schedule revival necessarily, but we're going to have special meetings uh, in, uh, Mar- in May, rather. And so what I'm looking to do and been praying about, asking the Lord for some direction, is um, from that point, I just kind of went backwards and, and uh, looked at some passages and, and uh, starting to work together some messages about um, this issue of the inner man. And uh, I'm not concerned, I just, as a pastor, I I want our inner man to be right and and prepared for uh, when we have this time scheduled for revival, that we'd be ready uh, as a church, that uh, we'd be thinking about some of the things in the areas that God wants us. Uh, to uh, be doing, to res- the way he wants us to be responding uh, in his word and, and to the preaching of his word. And so I just, I'm, I'm looking at several, uh, again, several passages of scripture and several messages and, and just trying to think through uh, some, some things about our inner man, our, our inner being, our, our heart attitude, if you will. And how does the Lord want our heart to be? What, what does he want our response to be? And we're going to start that tonight here in 1 Kings chapter 17, beginning in verse number 1. And the issue tonight is that of trust. What am I doing in, in trusting the Lord? And so if you find verse 1, I'll let you sit. We're going to read kind of an extended portion of Scripture here tonight as we uh, look at this passage of Scripture. But second, uh, 1 Kings rather 17, look with me at verse number 1 this evening. And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook brook Kirith, that is before Jordan. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord, for he went and dwelt by the brook Kirith, that is before Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning, and bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank of the brook. It came to pass after a while that the brook dried up, because there had been no rain in the land. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which, is, uh, which belongeth rather to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. So he arose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow woman was there gathering of sticks, and he called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal and a barrel and a little oil and a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first and bring it unto me, and after make for thee and for thy son." For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, the barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah, and she and he in her house did eat, what are the next two words? Many days. And the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail according to the word of the Lord which he spake by Elijah. Let's pray this evening, Lord. I pray that you'd help us again to, to get what you're saying here. And Lord, I pray that you'd give me wisdom and direction. Help me to, to understand um, all of the truths here so that I might best proclaim them to, to your people. That it might be a help. That we might have our hearts prepared and understand the, the, the seriousness of this issue of our inner man, our inner person. Lord, any of us in here can and probably are guilty of putting on a show or trying to make the outside look better than what the inside really is. So, Lord, help us to be people that desire to have our inside right first and understand that when our inside is right, the, the inner man is right, then that will show itself on the, in the outer man. And I'll be very grateful, and I know that uh, you'll use that in every one of our lives, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Well, long before, if you've ever built a house or seen a building build, you understand that long before the, um, the, the cool pieces go up, you know, the stuff like the walls and the roof and the, the, the rooms are outlined and all those things, there's uh, some digging that goes on in the dirt. You know, people come in with those big old tractors and they lay out the plans and, and they're looking at the plans and they're laying out those little... Uh, uh, colored flags, you know, it's like, what on earth? Why don't you just get on with the building already? Why, why are you messing around in the dirt? Quit digging in the dirt and let's do what it is you're supposed to be doing. Well, what are they doing when they're digging in the dirt? They're preparing for the foundation, all right? And more important than the walls, really, of a building or the roof of a building, the most important part is the foundation, if you don't have a good foundation, if, if the foundation is, is crumbling or weak or it's on a hillside and it hasn't been properly reinforced, then as nice as the house might look or the building might look on the outside, as, as great as you might have decorated on the inside or, or, or put nice things on the inside, once the foundation fails, the rest of it is going downhill quickly. I mean, it's, it's just going. You're, you're not going to be able to save it. The same thing is true in your Christian life and in mine. I can make the outside look good. I can put on a happy face and I can shake people's hands and I can make them think that everything in my life is going well. But at times, if I'm honest, I would say there are things in my life that are, man, it's a mess in there. And there's a storm going on in my heart and, and I, I'm not certain that I'm really trusting in the Lord because there's a lot of issues and, and doubts that I have in my mind and, and my inner man is not matching what I wish my, what I'm trying to portray my outer man to be. I, I, I've met people like that. In fact, I, I'm guilty of doing that at times myself. I, I want to to rush ahead and, and, and grow or to, to be farther down the road than my foundation really would allow me or, or support me to be. And without the firm foundation, a structure is useless. And without, without a foundation of these things that we're going to talk about over the next several weeks, your Christian growth, your, your Christian life is just, it's really waiting to crumble. And, and when the next thing, it's, it's like... Um, you ever played Jenga? You know what Jenga is? <laughs> You're taking out little pieces and man, this happens and this came up and I didn't expect this and sooner or later my life gets out of kilter and I fall over because my, I don't have a good strong base that, that my faith or my trust is built on. The states of Alaska and California are two states that experience the most earthquakes in our United States. And because of this, building codes have been put into place to ensure safety for residents in the event of earthquakes in those, those areas. And there's a lot of beautiful buildings that have crumbled to the ground because the structure that was uh, supporting these buildings and the foundation could not withstand an earthquake. And building according to earthquake codes in California and Alaska, it costs a lot of money. But you understand it costs more money to rebuild a building than it does to just have a firm foundation to begin with and to build on top of that? Well, think about your life in, in, in your Christian walk. You might be able to put on a, a happy face or, or, or even hide things that you think nobody else knows about. But sooner or later, something's going to come and that is going to be exposed in your life. And the damage that it causes costs much more to, to repair or to uh, work through or to get over than it would have if we just would have started with the right foundation to begin with. And so that's what we're, we're going to be talking about is what is it in, in our inner life that needs to be worked on? Where, where is it that God would say, son or daughter, in your life, this needs to be revived? I know, and we've said it before, we'll continue to say it, revival is just simply back to normal living, back to life. And, and we want to get back to a normal biblical way of living. And so, again, we'll, we'll look at that tonight, and it's going to begin here with this issue of trust. 1 Kings 17, our passage this evening, gives us the example of two people, a prophet and a widow. Now, both the prophet and the widow tr had to trust God in a difficult time in their life. And, and we can learn from them how to, they built trust in their life, how we can build trust in our own life. So let's get some setting for our story in 1 Kings chapter 17. 
By this time, and this is going to take you back, so you're going to have to put on that little thinking cap. I know it's Wednesday and it's late and you've been working. I know, I know. Just think with me. By this time in 1 Kings 17, is Israel one country or two? Two is the right answer, if you set it under your breath because you're embarrassed to get it wrong. Two is the right answer, all right? So you've got Israel in the north, if you remember that, the northern ten tribes, and then Judah in the south, the southern two tribes. Our story here in 1 Kings 17 takes place in the north, in the, the nation of Israel, all right? If you remember, how many of the kings of the nation of Israel were good? Zero. Zero. Twenty kings, and, and none of them, none of them, good. Well, at the time of 1 Kings 17, anybody want to venture a guess who's king and queen of Israel? You probably have heard their names. Ahab and, uh, boy, just a delightful lady named Jezebel are ruling in the nation of Israel at this time. At this point, Israel had forgotten God. They, their, their king and their queen had no intention of following God's ways or God's laws. They had no interest in doing the things that God wanted them to do. In fact, they brought about and, and continued to worship the idol Baal. And if you remember, there, there's all kinds of stories and, and true stories about Jezebel and how she was feeding hundreds of prophets of Baal every day uh, with uh, food from the nation of Israel. And she is, she's, she's single-handedly funding this false religion in the nation. Can you imagine that? God's people, not very far removed from coming to Jerusalem and, and giving the sacrifices and, and honoring the Lord and, and living for God. They're not that far removed from that. And yet now the nation finds itself in total rebellion against God. Now, God had promised a response when His people did that. Now, hold your place in 1 Kings 17. Take your Bible back to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter number 11. That's all the way back. Deuteronomy chapter number 11, all the way to the left, just before, or just after, rather, the book of Numbers. So if you hit Numbers, go back right. Deuteronomy 11, verse number 13. In Deuteronomy, did the nation of Israel have any kings or queens yet? No, all right? Uh, they had not had any kings or queens yet, but God knew that's what was going to take place, and so he put some laws or some, some statutes in place for when that took place. Deuteronomy 11, look at verse number 13. And it shall come to pass, if ye shall hearken diligently unto my commandments, which I command you this day, to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, that I will give you the rain of your land in his due season, the first rain and the latter rain, that thou mayest gather in the, thy corn and thy wine and thine oil. And I will send grass in thy fields for thy cattle, that thou mayest eat and be full. Take heed to yourselves that your heart be not deceived, and ye turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. And then the Lord's wrath be kindled against you, and he shut up the heaven, that there be no rain, and that the land yield not her fruit, unless ye perish quickly from off the good land which the Lord giveth you. So Elijah's proclamation here, when you, when you look at 1 Kings chapter number 17, of a coming drought is not just some, I've heard this preached this way, it's not just some crazy prophet coming in and, and blasting out this message that it's not going to rain. What Elijah is doing is he's simply proclaiming what God had already said in the book of Deuteronomy. Because you have turned against your God, the God that brought us into this land, He is going to stop the rain from falling. There will be a drought in this, in this land, and it will not rain again until I say so. He is proclaiming the truth of God. He says it in verse number 1, Elisha the Tishbite, who is of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word, unless I say, God will not bring rain again. And as always, God's word comes to pass. And so the nation of Israel, these northern ten tribes who are going in rebellion, led by Ahab and Jezebel, they're, they're, they're experiencing exactly what God had said. And life became this incredible season of testing. By the way, is Elijah living in the land? Yes. Yes. And so when he's saying that, he's not just saying, well, 
yeah, but I'm going to, you know, it's going to be steak and potatoes every day for me. That's not what happened. By the way, when you think through the story in 1 Kings 17, is the land of Zarephath included in this drought? Yes. Yes. And so, do you think that God knew that there's a widow and her son in the land of Zarephath that when He says, I'm going to bring a drought on the earth, do you think that God knew about the widow and her son? Yes. Yes. Did God already have a plan to take care of His prophet Elijah by way of the widow and her son that were all also going through the drought? Yes. Yes. So when God says this in Deuteronomy chapter number 11, now this, just hang on, when God says that in Deuteronomy 11, does God already know there's going to be Elijah that comes on the scene? Yes. 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 He already has planned and prepared for every event that's taking place in 1 Kings chapter number 17. These are not hard things for God. But come at it from Elijah's perspective and from the widow's perspective. Are these difficult times? Oh, yeah. Yeah. We live in a land of plenty here in America, and most of us, uh, we don't often pray for give us this day our daily bread because we stand in front of a full pantry and we say there's nothing to eat. All right? Um, that's what my kids do is the open refrigerator. And there's nothing to eat and the thing's full. We don't understand necessarily what it is to be gathering up sticks so that we might light a fire and cook the last little bit of food for our son and for us, and then we're going to die because there's nothing else left. But these people did. But yet God loves them and sees them enough to take care of these people during a time of trial and testing in their life. And through their responses here in 1 Kings 17, we see that the foundation of their faith was exposed. What are you really going to trust in? Are you going to trust in your way and your plan and your way of thinking? Or are you going to trust what God says and tells you to do? So I want us to see, first of all, here the trust of Elijah in our passage this evening. Because Elijah preached the word of the Lord to Ahab, he became really a kind of a special target for Ahab and Jezebel's anger. I mean, Ahab hated Elijah. He just, he could not stand him. Jezebel hated him, it seems like, even worse. And certainly, word probably got around that Elijah had gone to the king and said, it's not going to rain. And so he's probably not a real popular person in his even neighborhood because of what he has said here. But understand, Elijah is trusting God. He's following what God would have him to do. Verse number 2 of 1 Kings 17, look at what he does. The word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the book Kareth that is before Jordan. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. For he went and dwelt by the brook Kareth, that is before Jordan. So now, more than ever, Elijah has to trust God for everything. God told Elijah, what? To go. And what did Elijah do? He went. Right? It's very simple. It's very plain there in our passage this evening. His obedience was proof that Elijah was trusting in God. Right? Now, I know this, this sounds simple, but this oftentimes is one of the, the more basic things that people uh, seem to stumble with or trip over. The simple fact that I show I'm trusting God by obeying what it is He's telling me to do. So, the question then should come up in your mind, is that what I'm doing? Am I trusting God so much so that I'm being obedient to what it is He has me to do? Or am I trying to find ways to make a plan work in my own time, my own way, my own method? Am I thinking, well, yes, I, I trust God, but He's not really working you know, this deadline's getting close and he's not really seem to be working, so I've got to come up with another plan. Am I, am I living a life of obedience? Am I trusting God? Well, how did Elijah trust God? First of all, he went to Kirith. 
Verse 3, he, he hid himself, or he, God tells him to hide thyself by, by the brook Kirith. Because Elijah trusted God's direction, he saw then God provide in a miraculous way for his need. Look at what the Bible says here in verse number 5. Because he went, so he went and did according to the word of the Lord. For he went and dwelt by the brook Kirith, that is before Jordan. And notice verse 6. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning, and bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank of the brook. I've heard this statement before, and I think it's absolutely true. You may have heard it also. Where God guides, God provides. That's what he's done in Elijah's life. There's a drought that's going on. There's no rain. Well, we live in Texas. We understand what happens when there is no rain. What happens to that creek that runs, you know, uh, down the, in the neighborhood? Or what happens to the, to the river even that can rage at certain times? It dries up. There's a dry riverbed. Well, God tells Elijah, there's a drought, but I want you to go to this brook. I'm going to provide for you there. Now, if you've been in any parking lot around in our city or around any of the towns around us, there's those birds that... Uh, they always seem to be present, you know, those little black birds. And sometimes you'll even see a raven or a crow out there. Um, crows are not necessarily known for sharing their food. But that's what happens here in 1 Kings chapter 17. Because Elijah obeyed God, he's able to see a, mir a miracle take place in his own life simply because of his obedience. And this account of God using the ravens to sustain Elijah is, is miraculous. But Elijah, if Elijah would not have trusted God's direction, he would have missed out on God's provision. That's the same thing for you and me. If I don't trust God enough to the point where I obey what it is He's telling me to do, then I just, I'm giving up on the way that He wants to provide for my needs. I'm, I'm missing out. I, I'm bypassing and saying... No, the way that God wants to provide for that is not the way that I prefer, the way that I like. And so I'm going to forfeit God's working in my life. I'm going to give to myself whatever or in the way that I think is best. And that's tragedy. There is a way that seemeth right unto to man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Our human tendency runs contrary, it seems like, to trust. We, we like to analyze all the options, and then when we've analyzed all the options, then we determine our direction. Now, Pastor, are you saying there's anything wrong with planning? Not at all. No, we, we would have long-term plans. Certainly, I think that's wise to do. But it becomes unwise when I outplan God. When, when my plans don't have any room for God to move or work or even to overtake the plans that I had originally made. I'm not God. By the way, neither are you. I hope that's not a surprise. <laughs> but you understand that if I'm obedient, then I'm telling God, you have every right and, and every opportunity. I want to yield to you. If you want to change the course that I'm going, then Lord, I, I want to be obedient. I want to follow that's part of when we read Psalm 119 and we see that thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It's not like it's a big old spotlight. It's just one step at a time. And then I follow God the next step. And then he lights the way to the next and then I follow and I follow and I follow. Well, I'm a human and I'm a man and I'm impatient. And so I can find myself outstepping or outrunning God and God has to use things in my life to call me back to His will and His way. And far too many of us, I think, I think, miss out on experiencing great acts of God's provision because we refuse to trust Him for His direction. God promises to guide those that are willing to trust Him. We, we have read and, and oftentimes have seen the verse up on the, on the screen there, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not into thine own understanding. In all thy ways, acknowledge him. And what does he say he will do? He'll direct your path. Well, I don't know if that's the way that God is directing. Well, he said he would, so why don't you just wait until he makes it clear? David prayed, Lord, lead me in a plain path. And you know why? Because, Lord, there are enemies out there. Lead me in a plain path because of mine enemies. Psalm 18 and verse number 30. As for God, His way is what? 
Perfect. Perfect. It never fails. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler. That word literally, literally means shield. He's a buckler to all those that trust in him. So every time you, you think that your way or our plan is better, understand the Bible declares very plainly that when we'll trust God and be obedient to him, that's the safest place for us to be. That's the place of God's protection. Now, understand, does that always mean um, I might keep my life? No. No, I think of great missionaries um, and like, have you ever heard of Nate Saint, Jim Elliott, reaching those Indians in Central America? I don't think for one minute they were out of God's will. But you know what God allowed? That those heathen, savage Indians took those men's lives. But understand how God used a sweet spirit and a spirit of obedience in the wives of those men to go back years later and to see the chief and the tribe trust Christ for salvation. Because God has bigger plans than what you and I think are possible or that you and I think would, would ever work. We, we, we leave God out of the equation so many times. Hebrews 11, verse number 1, we, we understand that passage. Oftentimes we call it the hall of faith. But it begins in verse 1. It says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Hebrews 11, verse number 6, But without faith, it is impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and listen, and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Trusting God is a lifelong, understand, it's a lifelong privilege to be able to trust the God of heaven. And growing in this thing called the Christian walk is going to require constant surrender to follow God's direction. Right? Um, it sounds, I know, I, I'm going through this today again, and I'm just like, this, it, we sound like a broken record. In the adult Sunday school classes, we're talking about being changed into his image and being constantly surrendered to God's will. And it seems like we've been there on Sunday mornings. It seems like it's been covered on Sunday nights. And now, again, on Wednesday night, preacher, you couldn't find something else to preach about. <laughs> Well, you know why the Bible is so full of that? Is because God knows our heart and He knows we need to hear it time after time after time after time after time. Because there are plenty of us who go our own way, our own direction, and we have to continue to be told, child, you come back and you trust God Himself. You constantly are requiring surrender. So like this morning, you should have... Before your feet hit the ground, you should have said, Lord, today I want to surrender to you, your will and your way. Whatever it is you have for me, Lord, I want to surrender to that. Guess what you're going to have to do tomorrow? The same thing. It's just a constant day after day after day after day. I don't wake up and say, praise the Lord, it worked. Finally, I've read through eight chapters of changing to His image. I'm finally there. <laughs> I wish. But there's more chapters than chapter 8. You have to keep going. And by the way, don't, don't misunderstand. I'm not saying that book is the end-all, be-all. That book is directing us back to God's Word and what He says about it. And you and I are never going to get there until we see Christ face to face. But constantly, day after day after day, waving the white flag, God, today, I'm going to surrender. And if you're anything like me, there comes up times during the day when I have to re-surrender. When I've tried to grab the reins and grab hold or grab the wheel and say, Lord, I think I know better how this ought to go. God says, son, you, you don't know. There's a bridge out ahead. And I've got a detour coming in two days, two hours, two weeks, <laughs> two years that you don't know about yet, but you follow me. You, you trust me. You believe that my way is best. And he says he is a buckler to all those that trust in him. So that means we, we need to keep trusting God even when He directs us to places like the brook Kirith that seem unlikely and insignificant. Why, why go to a brook? It's just going to dry up. Well, Lord, I'm not doing anything for you here. But that's where God had him to prepare him for what he had next 
in his life. Well, secondly, then, not only does he go to Kirith, but in verse number 9, he has to trust the Lord, then, Elijah does, to go to Zarephath. Look at verse 9. Arise again, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. So he debated God about it. No. So he got on a boat to Tarshish. No. That was another one. No. So he arose and went to Zarephath. Now, if you were to look at a map, and in fact, I, I think I have one for you. This shows where Elijah was from. That's Tishba. Samaria is where King Ahab was. The brook Kirith is up on the east side of the Jordan. And the spelling there is different on this map. I, it's not to the spelling that you see in your Bible verse there. But uh, that's the same place, the brook Kirith. Well, look, God tells him to go leave there and go all the way north up to Zarephath. Zarephath was a Mediterranean town seven miles south of the town of Zidon. Now, if you have heard that name before, that sounds familiar. Zarephath was the hometown of Jezebel's dad. And so it would be like the equivalent of you or I as a, as a red-blooded American Christian person going into a, a Muslim country, going into the, the, the large city of a Muslim country and just deciding that's where I'm going I'm to live and I'm going to worship my God here. That's, that's kind of the equivalent of God telling Elijah to go to Zarephath. It, it wasn't a friendly place to, to God's people. But that's not all. Not only did God send Elijah to an unlikely location, he also sent him to an unlikely person, a widow. Well, this doesn't make any sense. But look at the words again of verse number 9 of 1 Kings 17. God says, Get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, now listen, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. Now that is amazing. That there's a, a woman who's lost her husband that has this one son who she's trying to take care of and out of all of this city that is unfriendly to, to really the things of the Lord or, or to God's people, and yet there's this, this one woman and her son that are alone in this town and God has seen them and singled them out and commanded her to take care of Elijah God's prophet. That's an amazing statement, an amazing thought. And I think it ought to help us understand, God is a sovereign God. He, he knows and He sees every single part of our life. He is working a plan that you do not know about yet. He is bringing things to, to, to pass and, and putting events and people together in your life to help and to provide and to encourage you. So do you think you can trust Him? You better believe that you can. And by the way, you, you, you should be trusting God. Elijah must have had plenty of questions for God regarding the, the manner of the provision. The, the food service via the ravens, that's surprising, but yet God used it. Now, why turn to a poor widow woman who, who's a mother to a son and expect her in a time of drought to feed me? And aside from being extremely humbling for Elijah, there surely must have been some level of feeling. As you read it, I almost sense like, boy, Elijah, you, you know, you got some nerve, man. And I think surely Elijah must have felt some of that. But is Elijah doing this because he's doing it of his own accord? No. He's simply doing what God told him to do. And so he's going to this woman and he's asking her first, instead of feeding yourself and your son, make me some first. Can you imagine? But yet Elijah has seen the birds bring him food. And he's taken drink from a brook that God continued to keep flowing until it was time to shut it off. And so he, he had come to the point where he said, okay, God, I know you can do this, and so I'm going to trust that what you're doing is right. And as the story unfolds, we see God taking care of Elijah and taking care of the widow 
and taking care of her son. He is answering this mother's prayers, blessing her faith, in trusting in God to, to some extent, and all the while feeding Elijah. And this unlikely plan was not God trying to create something difficult in the life of Elijah or something difficult in the life of this widow woman. Although we often assume that to be the case in our lives when God is not making any sense, we, we think He's trying to do this to, to harm us or to, 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 to test us in some way. And perhaps you're in a season of life like Elijah. You, you can't see the full picture. And it's in those times you have to ask yourself, am I fully trusting God? And am I obeying Him in every aspect of my life? Am I doing what it is He wants me to do? Is there anything I'm holding back on because I can't see the full picture? Now that can be a dangerous question. Over and over, God assures us of His love, His care for us, even when we can't see how He's working behind the scenes. Now, I'm going to have you turn to a couple of verses, and we'll finish this for tonight. Look at Isaiah 55. Go right just a, a little while. Isaiah 55 and verse number 8. Now, I know Isaiah is written to God's people before they went into captivity in Babylon. I know that. And so what he's saying is addressed certainly to them. But question, in the New Testament, are you and I called God's people? Yes. Does God say he's going to, did God say he's going to take care of his people? Yes. So look at Isaiah 55 and verse 8. Look at what he says to his people. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are my ways your, your ways, rather, my ways, saith the Lord. Look at Jeremiah, the next book over, Jeremiah 29. Again, I know who this is addressed to. Let's take it in proper context. It's addressed to God's people who are going into captivity. But he's just told them, I'm not going to forget you. I'm not going to leave you there. And so he says in Jeremiah 29, verse number 11, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you an expected end. I, I hope that's a comfort to us. That number one, the God of all the universe thinks about you. Wow. And that he's not trying to crush me under his thumb. He, he loves me enough to take care of me and to bring events to, to pass that he can meet my needs. What a wonderful, wonderful God we serve. Now, one final passage and, and just be reminded, a reminder for us. Look at Matthew chapter number 6 again. Matthew 6. We've just been here in our Sunday morning series. Matthew 6. Look at verse 25. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, or if that's the case, if, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast in the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, now can you imagine Elijah saying this? But God, what am I going to eat? God, what am I going to drink? God, what about these clothes? I mean, I, what am I even going to put on? Wherewithal shall we be clothed? Verse 31. For after all these things do the Gentiles seek for your heavenly Father. What's the word? Knoweth. Your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Elijah's test of faith was severe, but his trust shows us that God is trustworthy. See, what Elijah did 
what the widow does here makes no human sense. It, it doesn't make any sense at all. But Elijah followed God's direction, and through it all, God revealed his power. But Elijah wasn't the only one who's getting the, the blessing. Next week, we're going to look at the widow woman and the test that God brings in her life. Did she follow? Yeah. And she got to see God work an absolute miracle in her life. We'll get there next week.